Hi, this is Dr. Will Weed, and I'm here today uh, to give you a preview of our Bible study. I'm actually doing this a day early, and uh, we want to just uh, take this time, uh, this next few minutes, to go over Wednesday night's Bible study. And uh, we, as we've been talking about, is uh, sociology versus sophiology, and it's really not a versus or either or; it's the com it's the combination of both. And as we combine um, both of these uh, views of Christ, we get a full picture of our opportunity uh, to be enhanced by the Holy Spirit so that we have a full visual and experiential life here on earth where we can actually communicate with our Heavenly Father as He intends for us to communicate. So you will notice uh, that here on the screen we have... Um, um, these words. It says, the words call us up uh, short to what we are actually supposed to be doing on this path, not just admiring Jesus, but acquiring his consciousness. So here, this is a brief review of something that we talked about last week, and I'm kind of jumping into this live presentation now. It's true that for uh, the better part of the past 1,600 years, Christianity has put a lot more emphasis on the things we know about Jesus. The word orthodox has come to be um, inter interpreted as having the correct beliefs, along with the overt requirement here to learn what these beliefs are and agree with them. Comes also the subliminal message that the appropriate way to relate to Jesus is through a series of beliefs. In fundamentalist Christianity, this message tends to get even more accentuated to the point where faith essentially appears to be a matter of signing on the dotted lines to a series of creedal statements. Belief in Jesus is indistinguishable from belief about him, but this certainly wasn't how it was done in the early church nor can it ever be done this way if we are really seeking is uh, to come into a living relationship with this wisdom master. So if we are really seeking to come into a wisdom relationship with him, we're going to have to know all of him. Now one of the things that we've been learning in the past is that most of our projection memories and thoughts that run through our minds are past events. Like whatever we judge is based off of past uh, experience, it's never really present. Even the thoughts that go in, go through our minds, and the thoughts that are on our minds, are past, are related to the past experiences that we may have had. And seeing that the past does not exist, then most of the things that we're conscious of are illusionary. They're not real. We haven't trained our minds to be present and, and operate in the now. Because when we train our minds to be present and operate in the now, then what we see, we see uh, and perceive differently than what we see and perceive things as they are now. So that's a training of the mind, and that's what Christ comes to do, is help us train our minds to see properly. So instead of having beliefs of him saving us and delivering us, which is important, from sin and death, these are very important beliefs, we also need to adhere to his wisdom teaching, how to proceed through the life, how to uh, actually hear the Spirit of God, how to uh, dumb up the voice of the ego where you don't hear it at all because it's always past. Now if you start projecting into the future, that's an illusion. If you try to remember in the past, that's an illusion. You have to be present in the now to see things properly. Now if you think about it, it Anything outside of time is only in the now. There's no past, there's no future, that's just now. So we learn to elevate our minds to uh, non-dualistic thinking where we're one with God, we're in His now, we have the mind of Christ, and we think that way, then the wisdom that proceeds from the now begin to um, orchestrate and dictate our, our path as we walk this earth. We'll see things differently, we'll live di differently, we'll digest things differently. Our health will be differently, our mental health will be differently, our physical longevity will be different because we will be operating in the eternal wisdom of God. It is ours, it's attainable, but it's so simple that sometimes we can miss it because of the simplicity. So what we want to do is to lay down the structural teachings and reminders so that we can deconstruct all the things we have been learned, uh, we learned before and set them as cement in our minds. No, they're not cement. 
they are fluctuating be only not because I'm talking about sand fluctuating because of knowledge and increase not because you're shifting from one belief to another but you're building and establishing a firm foundation in Christ Jesus the proper foundation in Christ Jesus with the right teachings and thought about Christ and so that's what our endeavor, uh, our, our endeavors are is to actually lay a truer foundation that would than with that which have been laid in our minds in the past How do we see through these his eyes? How do we learn to respond to the world um, with the same wholeness and healing love? That's what Christian orthodoxy really is called about, is all about. It's about right belief. It's about right practice. It's not about right belief. It's, it's about right practice. It's not about right belief. Let me read that correctly. It's not about right belief. It's about right practice. Marianne approaches this question from a, a, a very intriguing perspective. Now that's, that's a reference or reference uh, to Philippians 2, 5, which, uh, um, uh, let this mind be in you as in Christ Jesus, and his perspective has to do with the kingdom of God. And so that's what we're reviewing now. He notices that throughout his teaching, Jesus uses one particular phrase repeatedly, the kingdom of heaven. You can easily confirm this yourself by a quick browse through the Gospels. The words jump out at you from everywhere. The kingdom of heaven is like this. The kingdom of heaven is like that. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Whatever this kingdom of heaven is, it's a fundamental, I'm sorry, foundational importance to what Jesus is trying to teach. So, what do we take it to be? Biblically, scholars have debated this question for about as long as there have been biblical scholars. A lot of Christians, particularly of a more evangelistical persuasion, assume that the kingdom of heaven means the place where you go when you die, if you've been good. But the problem with this interpretation is that Jesus himself specifically contradict, contradicts it when he says the kingdom of heaven is within you, that is here, and, the, and at hand, that is now. It's not later, but lighter. Some more subtle quality or dimension of experiencing accessible, uh, accessible to you right in the moment. You don't die into it, you awaken into it. So we, we have a real clear understanding about what the kingdom of heaven based on what Jesus is saying and not based on what is interpreted through doctrinal or creedal teaching. We have to look expressly to the words of Christ and allow the Holy Spirit to open our minds up to the, the thought and the vision that was in Christ when he said these words. Also about dependent on the Holy Spirit, he will awaken you to know those things that have been added that uh, onto what Christ said that are creedal, are, are tribal, are traditional, and those things which are directly from the spirit because he is spirit communicating with your spirit and he's communicating to your spirit truth. So this truth will kind of like spring up and bubble inside of you. You really don't need a teacher because he will remind you of all things because you've been taught all things and you will remember the things that Jesus has said to you, okay? The other approach people have consistently tried is to equate the kingdom of heaven with earthly utopia. The kingdom of heaven would be a realm of peace and justice where human beings lived together in harmony, a fair uh, and fair distribution of economical excess, assets. For thousands of years, prophets and visionaries have labored to bring into being their respective versions of this second kind of kingdom of heaven, but some have these earthly utopias, I'm sorry, but somehow these earthly utopias never seem to stay put for very long. And here again, Jesus specifically rejected this meaning. When his followers wanted to proclaim him as Messiah, he, he divinely, uh, the divinely anointed king of Israel, who would inaugurate the reign of God's justice upon the earth, Jesus shrank from all that and said, 
strongly and unequivocally, my kingdom is not of this world. Where is it then? Jim Marion's uh, wonderful, insightful, and contemporary suggestion is that the kingdom of heaven is really a metaphor for a state of consciousness. It is not a place you go to, but a place you come from. It's a whole new way of looking as, at the world, a transformed awareness that literally turns this world into a different place. Marion suggests specifically that the kingdom of heaven is Jesus' own favorite way of describing his state. We would nowadays call a non-dual consciousness or a unitive consciousness. The hallmark of this awareness is that it sees no separation, not between God and humans, not between humans and other humans. And, and these are indeed Jesus' two core teachings underlying everything he says and does. No separation between God and humans. When Jesus talks about this oneness, he is not speaking in an Eastern sense about an e a equivalency of being such that I am in and of myself divine. What he more has in mind is a complete mutual indwelling. I am in God. God is in you. You are in God. We are in each other. And see, and that difference is, is extremely important because there is this teaching that you are divine within and of yourself, which is a separation from God. He is, Jesus never taught any kind of uh, course in separation, being separate from one another or being separate from God or being other than. And so if I'm other than, then you're not other than with me. I'm in myself. I'm not dependent on you. But no, he's talking about a mutual indwelling. We mutually all indwell God and God indwells each and every one of us. We're not independent of our divine being. We are in our real self and complete I amness, God inclusive. God is in us, we're in each other, and we're in all that God created. Now this singleness of thought and this oneness and the unitive, unitive uh, thought is very difficult in the beginning to comprehend and to function in. That's why it takes a training, a purification of the mind, a rethinking, a transformation, if you were, to move from, from a mystic mind to a non-dualistic mind is the approach. And that's what the message of the kingdom of God is within you is all about. It's within you, it's at hand, it's near, it's here, and it's now because of where you come from and you are the ambassador of God's kingdom. Everything that you need is already in you because everything you need is already in the kingdom. There is not scarcity. There's no mind of scarcity. There's this abundance of everything that's in you. All your need is met by God. No scarcity of thinking now, and no fear because of the love that is just all around you. You're shrouded by love. You're covered by love. Love indwells you. So there's no fear of it at all inside of you at all because you are embraced by and you embrace truth which is spiritual. You are you're walking in the, uh, the uh, uh, perpetual grace of God at all times. There's no reason to fear. All the things that we learn traditionally begin to fade away and we begin to walk into Jesus Christ as his reality. His reality and his mind is now ours. We are one with God. Amen. Well, praise God, praise God. Let's continue. What, uh, what he more has in mind is a complete mutual indwelling. I am in God. God is in you. You are in God. We are in each other. His most beautiful symbol for this is the teaching in John 15 where he says, I am the vine. You are the branches abide in me as I am in you. A few uh, verses later he says, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. While he does indeed claim that the Father and I are one, John 10, 30, he does not see this as an exclusive privilege, but as something uh, shared by all human beings. There is no separation between humans and God because of this mutual interabiding, which is expresses the invisible reality of divine love. We flow into God and God into us because it is the nature of love to flow. And as we give ourselves into one another in this fashion, we, uh, the divine gives life and 
coherence to the branch while the branch makes visible what the vine is. After all, a, a vine is merely an abstraction until there are actual branches to articulate its reality. The whole and the part uh, live together in mutual loving reciprocity, uh, each belonging to uh, the other and depend on the other to show forth the fullness of love. There's Jesus' vision of no separation between human and divine. No separation between human and human is an equally powerful notion and equally challenging. One of the most familiar of Jesus' teaching is loving your neighbor as yourself. But we almost always hear that wrong. We hear love your neighbor as much as yourself. And of course, the next logical question then comes, but I have to love me first. I don't, you know, me first, don't I? I'm sorry. But I have to love me first, don't I? Before I can love my neighbor. If you listen closely to Jesus' teaching, however, there is no as much as in there. There is no as much in there. We, 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 should it. we do that. A lot of times when we're reading anything, scripture, the Bible, the newspaper, our minds will correct what we think uh, should be said or what we think is actually being said. It'll, it'll automatically add words there. We have to purposely read carefully what the Word of God is saying so that we can hear properly the vision that's been instilled in us by God's Word. So, let's uh, review. We are in God. God is in us. We are one with God. God is one with us. As He is, so are we, because we have a mutual indwelling in each other. Wow. And so we have to daily be conscious and aware of this on a daily, daily, daily uh, basis. Let's add a few more um, uh, slides to this and then we are going to end for tonight. Hopefully we'll end in just a few minutes and you can um, replay this, go over it again, talk to your friends about this, discuss it, uh, write me email questions if you have any and I'll be glad to answer them. It is complete seeing that your neighbor is you. There are not two individuals out there, one seeking to better himself or herself at the price of the other, or to extend charity to the other. There are, there are simply two cells of one great life. Each of them is equally precious and necessary. And as these two cells flow into one another, experiencing that one life from the inside, they discover that lying down one's life for another is not a loss of oneself, but a vast expansion of it because the individual, the indivisible the reality of love is the only true self. These are the core points of every radical teaching, not only light years ahead of its time, but way ahead of our own as well. These are the core points of a very radical teaching, not only light years ahead of its time, but, it, but way ahead of our own as well. This is the teaching that Jesus has brought to the earth. This is what we're going over. This is the teaching that the ego fights uh, whew, tooth and nail trying to keep us on a defensive, trying to keep us in a judgmental mind and see instead of seeing the finished work of God because our mind is filled with history and past experiences. We can't see the present truth that the victory has already been won in the now. Christ is now Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Hearts have now been rescued from anything that would divide them from Christ. When we begin to break bread and think as Jesus thought and speak as Jesus spoke, we will see, we will see the manifestation of his kingdom in the lives of others and his kingdom will bear fruit in this life on the earth. Well, that's a lot of teaching. This, this is 
So we're going to conclude that, give you some time to meditate on that and think about it. Now, uh, today I don't have my slides up, I don't have my templates up, but don't forget to go to www.nccfc.net. That's our web page. And uh, go there, visit about our calendar, see the things that we are doing. And I uh, thank you for tuning in tonight on our YouTube channel. Make sure you tell your friends about it so they can tune in as well. You don't have to be a member to take this course, these classes on Wednesday. Anybody's invited. Just like we have an open church in a building, anybody can come to these live, uh, our, um, our premiere showings of our lesson on Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. They come to your house, they can do it in their own home, on their own iPhones or Android phones. You can view me by way of YouTube by going to our YouTube channel, which is Will We 3. Will We 3 is our channel. Well, until next time, I want you to remember God has plans for your life, and none of those plans include